Have you ever heard the expression, clothes make the man? Well, here's a picture of what that might look like. My husband, Rich, recently portrayed three different characters in various film projects. Can you see the difference in the characters? The clothes kind of help you understand that these are different people, right? As we continue our series, what happens when a created people walk away from their creator? We come to a passage in Isaiah's 61st chapter. We're only going to be looking closely at two verses today, but before we dive in, I want to recap. This has been a sobering series, I think. There have been moments of joy and moments of rejoicing, but we have seen how very bleak the world gets. We're reminded of it even just now, when the people that God created walk away from him. We see how immoral, how evil, how destructive, how violent, murderous, really, the world has become. We see how the Lord's heart is broken when he has made a binding covenant with people, his people, and they walk away from him. And we see, Lord God, that, well, we see that the Lord God desires that his people will continue to love him, that he will be their God, they will be his people when they join in this unbreakable covenant, unbreakable from the Lord's point of view, but certainly breakable from the human point of view. There's a lot of benefits to being in this covenant with the Lord, not the least of which is eternal life, but also protection on earth and being guided by him and most especially having his presence, his beautiful, soothing, wonderful, loving presence. But walking away from the Lord, on the other hand, it's led to almost total destruction of the earth by flood. It's led to sin after sin, even after the restart with Noah. And there's a breaking of the covenants God has made with, with Abraham and, and with Moses and the Israelites. Walking away from the Lord has meant that evil is a constant companion, constant companion on this earth. And even we know evil in our hearts now. And if we're true, truly honest, each one of us can say we have known that evil in our heart. Walking away from the Lord has required his salvation. And he has saved. In the days of Isaiah, he provided deliverers, often in the form of humans, who would come and do the Lord's work to liberate the people from whatever the bondage was that they were in at the moment. And beyond that, the Lord provided miraculous deliverances. Uh, remember the Red Sea, or even when the River Jordan parted. And even we've seen pictures of, of the enemy armies being destroyed by angelic intervention. The history of the Lord and his people has been marked with cycles of rebellion and return. Rebellion and return. The return has usually come as a result of a punishment that the Lord allows, a punishment that wakes the people up, gets them back to their senses, and helps them return to the Lord. We see this when we started the whole series, and Pastor Jim opened up the, the prodigal son parable to us, and we see how that prodigal son left his father, and he needed really to be plunged into the utter desecration and misery of a pigsty in order to come to his senses and return to his father. Well, now we're in the we're still in the book of Isaiah. We come to his long book of prophecy, and we join the Israelites as they continue in this exile from the land that they were given. And they, this exile to the land of the Babylonians is going to last 70 years, and it's probably going to consume the life of a number of Israelites. In fact, probably the ones who actually helped lead the nation into rebellion. It, it's fitting, I think, that the punishment would fall most heavily on those who are responsible for the rebellion. But Isaiah has been speaking hope to us. He's been speaking hope to the people in Israel. 
and the people who are exiled in Babylon. He has been reminding them, and he reminds us, therefore, that there will be a day when the Lord will deem the punishment is enough. It has done what it was sent to do. And when that day comes, the Lord is going to deliver the exiles out of punishment, out of banishment, out of exile, and return to their land. And not just their land, but most importantly, him, the Lord himself. In the part of the book of Isaiah that we're in today, he writes of a servant of the Lord, one who will suffer, and in that suffering will accomplish the work that the Lord needs done in order to restore his people. When Isaiah first introduces the idea of the servant, he focuses not on who that servant is. He focuses, focuses, he focuses on what that servant will do. And frankly, the people are, they know, they, they understand from the scripture they have. They have the law, they have the Psalms, and they have some of the prophets. They know Israel is really considered the servant in their day. But we, we in the new covenant on this side of the cross, we have the benefit, the advantage of knowing what happened some 20, 20 years ago. We have 2020 vision. We know that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is that servant. We know he was the anointed one and that he completely fulfills the prophecies that Isaiah has spoken of. But. When the people first hear this prophecy, they're languishing in Babylon. They have no notion of the servant of Jesus, and most probably, frankly, they don't really care. What they mostly want is what is he going to do for them? And that was he was going to bring deliverance, redemption, restoration, and salvation. Today's passage is Isaiah 61, verses 10 and 11. But I would be remiss if I neglected to refer you to Pastor Linda's excellent message of last week on the first part of Isaiah 61. That message opens with the, the piece of scripture we call the Nazareth pericope because it is the scripture that Jesus read in synagogue in Nazareth and he applied it to himself. That's how we know for certain that this servant is Jesus. And when he spoke, Luke 4 records it, that he says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus said, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Without question, he affirmed and confirmed that he was Messiah. And this passage, therefore, we know to be him. And his time on earth, it started with his conception by the Holy Spirit in the willing servant, Mary. And it moved through even his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and even now this time this time of the Holy Spirit working on earth through these very actions that Jesus describes, that Isaiah first described. The servant has his spirit. The good news is going out. The binding up of the brokenhearted is happening. The prison doors are opening. The eyes are opening. The blinded eyes can see. The time and the times of the Lord's favor is clearly upon the people he has come to deliver, to redeem, to restore, and to save. But Isaiah's prophecy does not end with the time and the times of the Lord's favor. It continues on. And I've asked Rich to read chapter 61 in fullness to us. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, to the afflicted, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, the opening of the eyes to those who are blind, 
and recovery of their sight, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified, that he may display his beauty. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers, but you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as the ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in the land they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. Robbery with burnt offering. I will faithfully give them their recompense. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations. And their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause the righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. Recall that Isaiah's hearers would not have the knowledge of Jesus. So their understanding of this prophecy probably would be that it refers to the Lord sending a deliverer to restore them in their land, one that they've uh, known a kind of deliverer such as they have known before. And that deliverer would end up wiping away every vestige of shame, of injury, of pain, and, and it would give them joy, the work of this deliverer. It would kind of garland them with joy, beauty, peace. Isaiah would be speaking to them about their future when the consequences of walking away from the Lord would be erased when they are returned to his presence and he to theirs. Today, we're going to focus on verses 10 and 11. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before the nations. These verses are continuing in the voice of the one who opened this chapter, the one who said the spirit of the Lord was upon him, the anointed one. He is the one speaking, and now he is proclaiming the great joy he takes in the Lord God. This deliverer, the one who bears the spirit of the Lord, is adorned in clothing. In the Bible, clothing is of great significance. It is usually representative of something. In this case, the clothing represents what the Lord is going to do for his people through this anointed one. The Lord is going to bring salvation. 
As one commentator I read of said, this is what the people really need. They need salvation. But the anointed one is also going to be wearing a robe of righteousness because that's what the Lord needs. The Lord can't receive the people into his presence if they are not righteous. For his holiness, his righteousness would completely destroy them. And so the anointed one is the perfect mediator. He's the go-between for the people who have walked away from their creator and the creator himself. He brings salvation to the people and stands in righteousness on their behalf before the Lord. The picture of the bridegroom and the bride is a picture of a marriage covenant. It refers to that covenant that the Lord God, Yahweh, his covenant name, has made with the Israelites. It's a reminder to Isaiah's hearers that the Lord is going to remember his covenant. No matter what happened, no matter their sin, he's going to remember and he will restore them to the position of honor. The Lord will marry them again, so to speak. And in preparation of that remarriage, the Lord's preparing his anointed one. He dresses the anointed one in his priestly turban, and he drapes the anointed one with jewels as carefully as a bride and groom would prepare for their wedding day. The anointed one is well prepared in both his character, which is who he is, and his commitment, which rests in the covenant. He is well prepared to recut, to remake, to recommit to the covenant between the Lord and his people. And verse 11, well, doesn't that just take you back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2? It indicates that the earth and the garden in particular bring forth their fruit. Humans only have the job of aiding in this because all life springs only from God. Just as the Lord is the only one who can bring forth the growth on the earth, so he is the one who brings forth the righteousness and praise that's going to be displayed before all the nations. And so verse 10 tells us in the anointed one's voice that he's being prepared as indicated by the clothing for his task of deliverance, redemption, restoration, and salvation. And verse 11 tells us that this very task of deliverance, of redemption, of restoration, and salvation will be fruitful. Like the good earth, it will bring forth right relationship, righteousness, and praise to the entire world. And what is wrapped up in these two short verses? rejoicing, exulting, praise, sprouting up along with the deliverance, along with the redemption, along with the restoration and the salvation. Praise. The work of the Lord is as accomplished by the anointed one creates such a great joy, a joy that literally busts out of the mediator, busts out of the anointed one for the joy that was before him. He endured the cross. And it literally busts out with life across the globe. What a great future the exiles of Isaiah's day had to look forward to. The Lord's salvation causes the returned to rejoice. The returned will rejoice. They will revel in the Lord. And now we know that the anointed one is Jesus and that his task on earth was exactly what Isaiah is describing. Jesus, born without sin. Jesus, lived without sin. Jesus, died on the cross to pay for our sin. Jesus, raised from the dead to defeat death and sin. Jesus, lifted into heaven sending forth the Holy Spirit to continue his work of deliverance, of redemption, 
of restoration and salvation until Jesus returns again. And those who return to the Lord will still revel in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, because the returned revel in the Lord. So the invitation to us, good people, is revel in him. Revel in the Lord. Some of us have sin that remains unconfessed. It's blocking our joy. It's blocking our rejoicing. It's blocking our ability to revel in him. Confess now that sin and return to him. Others of us are just weary. We are weary from the good fight. I say to you, good people, turn away from your self-absorption now. Confess that weariness and let him put that spirit of rejoicing on you, that spirit of reveling. I'm going to pray now. And then we're going to revel in the Lord through a beautiful peace. And I'm going to tell you about that peace after the prayer. But let me first come to you, Lord, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we confess that we have not rejoiced, we have not reveled in you, in the way that is our heritage, in the way that is our privilege, and in the way that would please your heart. And so we say to you, forgive us. Forgive us by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver us, redeem us, restore us, save us, from our sin and wash it away as far as the east is from the west and the north is from the south. Carry it away for you have called. We who are still exiled on earth, who still live with the consequences of the many who have walked away from their creator, you have called us to rejoice and revel anyway, no matter what we experience, no matter what we see. You have called us into our inheritance, and you say rejoice. And so we say, as you carry the sin away, pour out that spirit of rejoicing through your Holy Spirit. We receive, we place our hands open before you, and we receive the spirit of rejoicing and reveling. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord, in his name we pray. And for those of us who don't really know Jesus, he's really not our redeemer. He's really not our savior. He's not our Lord. He hasn't restored us. We don't understand all of this. Today you can. Today you can. For Jesus died for your sins. And all you have to do is say yes, Yes, I need a savior. And today I say, you be my savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Forgive me of my sin. Turn me away from walking away from you to running toward you in rejoicing and reveling for I will be redeemed by you. I will be delivered. I will be restored and I will be saved. I choose you. Make me new by the Holy Spirit who continues the work of Isaiah 61 on earth. In his name, I pray. We are in the a Hebrew month. I'm not going to try to pronounce it for you because I might say it wrong, but okay, let me be brave. We are in the Hebrew month called Elul. And I learned something lovely about this month. Usually, if you were in ancient Israel, you went to see the king, you would make an appointment, you'd go to the cat palace and you would hope that he would have time to see you, that somebody in his court would open the way for you. But in this month, in this Hebrew month, in the Jewish tradition, it's not in the scripture, but in the Jewish tradition, the king would come out to meet the people where they were. The king would come to you. And so too today, the king comes to you to bless you, to make his face shine upon you, and to be gracious to you, to lift up his countenance upon you, 
and to give you shalom, peace. Go forth, receive that spirit of rejoicing and reveling and revel in him. Rejoice, for he is good. Amen and amen.